going to start recording this, okay? Um, when we're talking about active versus passive learning, um, it's going to help, well, one, not waste your time, all right? Uh, your time is valuable, as you know. When you've taken this class previously, your time is very valuable in regards to uh, how much time that, that you might have in your own personal life, your work life, and then trying to take this class. Okay, so we know the material is dense and the time is usually said to be not enough to learn it in. That's very common and I understand that. So I'm actually really excited this semester and you'll have to bear with me with the timing of, this, of the course semester, please, because this is the first time that I've taught 211 in which I haven't had to use class time, that I haven't had to use class time for tests, which again gives me more time to teach the lecture and lab material which is gonna be very beneficial for you. Unfortunately, you have to listen to me a little bit more often, okay? So uh, again, I'm just trying to experiment and kind of play around with um, uh, when classes will be. And we might get done early, and it doesn't mean that I'm gonna be letting you out of the class early, but what I mean by that is you might be getting done early with a chapter. And that means then, okay, we can start the next chapter. And that way I don't have to cram all that material in. So we're going to give that a shot and see, okay? Again, this is the first time, the last time I, I taught 211, I had to give tests during uh, uh, class time. So um, it made it, uh, you know, again, I'm losing that teaching time. So when we're talking about active and passive learning, all right, we've talked about when you're listening to somebody versus when you're hearing somebody. Basically, how I look at it is when I'm listening to somebody, especially if it's a heated argument, um, I can pretty much recite what that person said to me. Now, a lot of times when you're hearing somebody, you're hearing something, it's a perfect example, I do it all the time. Um, I'll sit in front of the TV if a football game is on or I'm watching a Netflix show or uh, something on Hulu and it'll be a show running in the background. And yeah, I can hear conversations in it, but I'll be focused on the work that I am uh, doing on my computer, let's say, and I might not be able to really recall what's going on in the TV. All right, so there is a difference between uh, 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 hearing and listening. One is active and one is passive. So kind of keep that in mind. We always want to be active, all right? And so when we're active, we are taking an active role in our learning process there, all right? So a lot of students, when they're undergoing the active process of learning, all right, they're going to take a more active role, asking questions, for example, in class. In fact, I'm going to give you some examples of active learning here on this next slide here. Okay, obviously attending class, coming to class, you're doing something. That's what active learning is basically going to be, all right? Doing something, not just sitting there, all right? There's been countless times where I've sat when I was sitting as a student reading my lecture book and I read a couple pages and then I look away from the book and then I think to myself, I don't remember a darn word that I just read, okay? Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that's happened to some of you. So I was passively learning, all right? Actively learning if I would have been able to recall a lot of that information. So some things to help with that active learning is taking notes in class actively, all right? Reading the assignments, all right? If you have time, I know time is limited, but we have those supplemental materials there like Learn Smart and whatnot, all right? Those assignments, all right, will help you. All right, so when you're taking those notes from class, going back and reviewing those notes and studying from those materials will definitely make a big difference. Obviously, listening in class and finally learning from the mistakes that you have made, all right, on a test or if you were thinking something about a certain concept while I was talking about it in class and you came to the wrong conclusion and then you realized uh, that you were confused on it and you asked me a question to explain it to you and then when I explain it to you and you finally quote unquote get it, all right, then you're learning from that mistake that you made, all right, when you um, mi misunderstood the concept, let's say, okay? So keep in mind, all right, when we're talking about that active learning, all right, we are going to be focusing on um, being self-motivated, all right, these are the students that take an active role in motivating themselves, don't procrastinate, get right into learning and reading. Reading ahead maybe before you come to class, reading chapter 17 and 18 before we start going over that material. Um, for example, also 
uh, labeling the lab atlas then, then you can actually start to take more notes and listen to some of the things that I'm saying. All right. Um, don't mind me. I know I'm taking my face shield off. I got to fix this thing real quick. Okay. <clears throat> Just to let you know, I am sitting in class by myself with my face shield on. <laughs> All right. You definitely know that Sean was actively learning. He did a good job. Um, but part of that is, you know, and again, you can utilize that because you're going to find out this semester because we're, we're, we're kind of done with, when I say the basics, we're going to go system by system by system now. I no longer have to teach you what a cell is. I no longer have to teach you about the basic concepts of homeostasis. You should already know that. And we're going to be falling back on a lot of those concepts. And don't you worry. I'm going to bring it up. I'm going to remind you of certain concepts. And hopefully it'll, it'll knock some of the cobwebs loose and, and you'll be like, oh, that makes sense. And when you, when you have that aha moment, then it'll make the material that we have to learn this semester that much easier for you. We, get, we build that strong foundation, all right? Then we can build upon that, okay? Um, so some of the things that we'll see, all right, from all right, our active learners are going to be asking questions, all right? For those of you that were with me last semester, Sean did that all the time, all right? So he asked questions quite a bit in lecture class, all right? So obviously taking accurate notes, but when we say accurate notes, taking good quality notes, all right, that are going to help you learn the material, all right? That is huge, okay? Not wasting time in class, staying on task. You hear that all the time. I used to hear that all the time when I was uh, in middle school elementary school I had a very difficult time uh, staying on task all right but we're gonna try now don't worry we're gonna have fun in this class we'll have we'll cut up a little bit but for the most part we want to stay on task all right um, again making sure that you're completing your assignments all right as soon as you can that's why I tried to space out the assignments all right, not making them clustered together all at one time before a test. All right, so we give you a few assignments here and there throughout the course. That way you're not getting bogged down. All right, this uh, course here, all right, there's a lot of material to learn. I know you're getting tired of me saying that, but we're going to give you a little bit more time to work on that with some fewer assignments. All right, but these assignments that we do give you, all right, will be helpful. Okay, they'll help you to uh, understand where your weaknesses are, okay? Because again, you're gonna make mistakes and the important thing is we want you to learn from those mistakes, all right? So keep that in mind, all right? So our active learners are definitely going to be able to learn more material in a smaller amount of time because you're not wasting your time. And over time, you won't have to put forth as much effort, not to say that you're gonna slack off, but you won't be killing yourself and trying to pull an all-nighter. Okay, and then it'll as time goes on, all right, you'll be able to understand that material much more easier. Okay, that's going to be huge, 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 huge. Okay, um, yeah, yeah, I'll we'll skip past that. All right, so one of some of the things that I like to tell students to avoid that's the passive learning is daydreaming. I used to do that quite a bit, and the pot, and that and part of that was. You know, me not uh, keeping on task. Take notes, all right? Now, here's the thing. Uh, when I say take notes, I mean, yeah, if it works for you to take notes when you're sitting here in lecture class, great, all right? Um, but if not, no worries. These recordings, all right, will be made available, then you can sit down on your own and go through the recordings and take notes then, okay? Do your homework assignments and do them on time, all right? Ask me for help, I love questions. I love them, okay? I think I might even love them more than my dog, and I love my dog a lot, she's a really good dog. All right, um, don't skip class, come to class, okay? You'll trust me, studies have been done, people that attend class, all right, and pay attention in class are more successful, all right? Do not try to cram everything in the night before, it won't work. You, you're, all of you, if you're here in 211, you know that doesn't work, okay? It just doesn't work, okay, unless you're some super genius. I had the pleasure of having a super genius as a roommate in college, 
and I wanted to strangle him because he was so smart and I was so jealous. But it worked for that person, okay? But this won't work here, okay? And please participate in class, even though there's not a participation grade, but trust me, it will help, all right? It will definitely help. So don't do anything uh, last minute, okay? Don't wait the day before the test to start studying, okay? That's bad, okay? And if you are concerned about your grades, don't wait until we've had three lecture and lab tests. Because by then, usually in most cases, it's too late. Look at your first lecture test. Look at your first lab test. If there is some concern, then come talk to me. Don't wait. All right? We don't have extra credit, so that's easy. We don't allow extra credit in um, at Greenville Tech in the biology department. So I can't give it to you. Don't ask it, okay? Because you won't get it from me. All right? So again, don't stay silent. Ask me questions. Okay, try to take notes as much as you can in class. If not, don't worry about it. If it works better for you to come back and look over the stuff later on, that's fine. All right, but try to stay active. You're not gonna learn if you're on your phone. I'm not gonna let you be on your phone. All right, don't make me call you out, okay? Please pay attention and don't miss class, okay? And if you do, talk to one of your classmates, get the notes from them, okay? All right. Let's jump in. Any qu Oh, phew, this is one of the most important slides. Ha ha ha. Okay. So stay healthy as long, when I say as long as you can, stay healthy forever, obviously, but stay healthy, all right, as much as you can, all right, because that is going to play a role in the learning process for you. If you are not getting enough sleep, all right, that is anywhere between six to eight hours, all right, prefer preferably towards the latter. All right, you are going to be compromising your immune system. We'll talk about this. All right, if you're eating a garbage diet, all right, you are going to be compromising your immune system. That can be a problem. Exercise when you can. What's a form of exercising? Walking. Okay, you want to come to class? Don't take the elevator unless you have to. All right, take the stairs. Trust me. Trust me. Okay, no drinking, obviously. I'm not here to tell you, all right? This is referring to alcohol, this, okay? But drink in moderation, all right? Obviously, don't smoke. I respect your choice, your right to have choice, but you'll learn in this semester of all the bad things that smoking can do, okay? And keep your stress levels as low as possible, okay? High levels of stress, I know it's easier said than done, but high levels of stress will again affect your health, okay? All right. That PSA public service announcement is over. Okay, let's get down into the nitty gritty and jump into the endocrine system. All right, the endocrine system, chapter 17. Try to, time to bust out the notes, okay? Um, back in chapter one, we talked about homeostasis. We talked about the components of homeostasis, the basic components, all right, the receptor, the control center, and the effector. And there were two parts of the control that made, there's two components that made up the control center. Last semester in chapter 12, we studied, all right, the nervous system. That was one component of the control center, all right, that was based on electrical signals. Okay, using electrical currents to send messages, all right, to effector organs. Well, this semester in chapter 17, we're going to learn about the other component, and that is the endocrine system, okay, glands, the chemical component, all right. This control center is going to affect, all right, and, and, and initiate its response to certain stimuli through chemical um, um, signals, elicited by glands, okay? So let's jump in and talk about, first of all, what the endocrine system is, all right? You remember that when we learned about glands, there were two types, endocrine and exocrine, okay? Endocrine are ductless. Whoops, where's my pen? All right, ductless, okay? Which means that these glands have to secrete their product 
immediately outside of themselves into the interstitial space or fluid, or also known as the extracellular space, all right, or immediately into a blood vessel. Okay? So it will release its product, which we will be talking about, are called hormones, okay, chemicals that are going to elicit an effect on something. All right, these hormones are going to be released into directly into your bloodstream or into the interstitial fluid or space outside of the glands and eventually find their way into the blood. But ultimately, they're going to find their, their way into our bloodstream. And then these chemicals, these hormones are going to circulate throughout your body, all right, and wind up finding the target cells, okay? So it's a real simple kind of concept here, all right? You have a stimulus, okay, that's going to occur, all right? And then that stimulus is going to be monitored by a receptor of some sort. And that receptor, remember, this, this is familiar with chapter... Uh, 13 when we were talking about reflexes because that's basically what this is and you're going to find out we're going to kind of review all this all right but ultimately this sort of reflexive um, uh, response all right is we're actually looking for and targeting all right these structures here that we call target cells so that's why it makes sense that's why we call them target cells because these target cells have special or specific receptors all right for a specific type of chemical or for a specific hormone, okay? <clears throat> so what will happen is these receptors on the target cells will bind the hormone, and then that hormone will elicit some sort of response, and we'll walk you through that process there, okay? So basically, this part here at the bottom of our screen Okay, the hormone is going to be released from the gland, all right? It will then be released into the interstitial fluid, which will eventually enter into the bloodstream. So the hormone will then go all throughout your circulatory system, searching for target cells. It's going to come into contact with a lot of different types of cells, but if they don't have those special or those specific receptors, then it's not gonna have any effect on those cells, okay? So it's cell specific because those specific target cells have specific receptors for that hormone, like a lock and key, that's simple. Remember ligands and receptors, okay? So I have tons of keys on my keychain. When you come to class, you'll see all of them, all right? If you're, especially if you're waiting outside for me to get into the room because it takes me forever to sometimes find the right key to get in, all right? But I have the right key. It just takes time. But some of those keys are the wrong key. So I'll put them into the lock and twist it, and it won't open up, all right? Very similar to what goes on in our body, okay? You'll have hormones. we got tons of hormones floating around all the time, all the time, all right? But if those target cells don't have a specific receptor, then you're out of luck, okay? All right. So let's jump into, all right, when we're talking about our control systems of the body. Remember, the two types of control systems are what we're talking about this semester, the endocrine system, and then our nervous system is the other control system, okay? So some, a similarity between the endocrine and the nervous system is that both release ligands. You heard me mention that just a few moments ago. All right, those are those chemical messengers. Perfect example, all right, of a ligand, all right, in the nervous system is going to be acetylcholine. Remember acetylcholine? All right, our presynaptic neuron, all right, remember at the end there, you have the synaptic knobs, and in those synaptic knobs, we have the synaptic vesicles, all right? And in those synaptic vesicles, we have a neurotransmitter of some sort. Okay, so when an action potential travels down that presynaptic axon, okay, and it travels down and it triggers the opening of our voltage-gated calcium channels, this is a big reason why calcium is so important, okay, 
when it triggers the opening of those voltage gated calcium channels, they open up. Calcium is in higher concentration outside the cell than inside the cell. And so calcium comes pouring into the cell, gloms on, it's attracted or travels towards those synaptic vesicles. And it gloms onto those synaptic vesicles, causing those synaptic vesicles to move towards the synaptic clock. And it releases its neurotransmitter into the synaptic clock, which is a chemical. It diffuses across the cleft onto the receptors that are specific for it, and it'll trigger some sort of response. Okay? Usually it opens up gates. Okay? Chemical gates. And then it allows for the movement of substances across the plasma membrane. Okay? So that is a similarity because we'll see the same thing here with the endocrine system. We're dealing with chemicals, all right? And those chemical messengers we refer to as ligands. And those ligands will bind on to specific cellular receptors, all right, on our target cells. And they'll elicit some sort of response in the target cell, okay? That's a similarity. Now, all right, we know with the nervous system, it uses, all right, electrical current in the form of an action potential. In the endocrine system, we're going to use chemicals, our hormones. They'll travel throughout the blood in search of the target cells with the correct type of receptor, okay? So its response is going to be very widespread, okay? Also, all right, the endocrine system, the reaction time will be longer. Okay, nervous system reaction time is shorter because we shut off the neuron. We're no longer sending out action potentials. Boom, we're done. But once we've sent out, all right, our hormones, they're circulating throughout your circulatory system. So they're going to be there for a while, depending on whatever the half-life is or how long it takes for that hormone to degrade or how long it takes for that hormone to be removed from circulation. So that's why the reaction times will be longer will have longer lasting effects, okay? If it's like a, a, an adrenaline response with epinephrine and norepinephrine, norepinephrine, it can be, that response could be for a few moments, okay? In other cases, when we're talking about some of our sex hormones, growth hormones, days and weeks, okay? We get to learn about all this cool stuff. Exciting. This figure here, 17.1, is showing you, let me zoom in a little bit, All right, you can see here, all right, we're seeing what's going on with our endocrine system here, all right? So you have your endocrine cells here, all right, that are uh, secreting the hormone, all right, into the interstitial space and into the blood vessel, all right? Those hormones enter into the blood vessel. They enter into your systemic circulation, all right, in search of the target cells. They'll then exit out of circulation, enter into the interstitial fluid in space, and then they'll enter into the target cell if the receptor is present. And then it'll elicit its response. Okay? Now we're talking about the neuron here. You have your action potential, which is an electrical current right, that will travel down, all right, and then elicit a chemical, all right, there's a chemical component to the actions of our nervous system because we're again involving the neurotransmitter, which is going to be our chemical. So the neurotransmitter, which is stored here, all right, in the synaptic vesicles, will then, all right, exit the neuron and enter into the synaptic cleft, diffuse across the cleft, and then bind onto the, the specific receptors on the other side of the synaptic cleft and cause some sort of response, okay? So you can kind of see the similarities, right, and some of the differences between both of those. That's not it. There we go. All right. Any questions so far? Am I going too fast? Okay. <clears throat> Good deal. All right. So let's talk about 
some of the general functions all right, of the endocrine system. All right, and there's a lot. And, and, and think about this too. You know, you know some of this stuff. You know what growth hormone is going to do. You know, all right, what your uh, puberty hormones are going to do. All right, insulin, we talked about that a little bit. Um, we talked about how the responses of certain uh, hormones like uh, parathyroid hormone. We talked about that with bone growth, calcitonin, okay? So there's a couple things. So when we're talking about some of the functions here, all right, of the endocrine, uh, system, a lot of it is going to be involving some sort of regulation, okay? And so we'll see, all right, this regulation in certain um, parts of our organismal development and metabolisms, okay? So we'll see, all right, how certain hormones will help regulate our growth overall or the embryonic cell division, okay? Also differentiation, when we see that certain cells, all right, are going to transform from one cell line into another. Okay, we'll talk about some of that in more detail throughout the semester, all right? But that basically falls under development, all right, and growth. We'll also talk about metabolism, okay? And we'll get into a little bit more detail about the differences in metabolism. I obviously, you know that metabolisms are going to be basically just chemical processes that uh, us as a human undergo. We saw how it worked for cell uh, metabolism for certain processes to help build, help repair, help to actually grow the cell, all right? And in, when you're involving uh, metabolism, all right, sometimes you have to build some things up and sometimes you have to uh, uh, tear some things down. So if we're gonna tear something down, that's not very good. That could be catastrophic. Like if I have to tear a building down, it's not good for the building. So that's catabolism, all right? If I need to build something up, all right? So catabolism, an example of that is when you're eating. If you're eating, all right, an apple, all right, you started with a whole apple, right? And your body is going to metabolize that, all right? And it's going to, break it from a large something into many smaller somethings, okay? Now, when we want to build something up, like muscle mass, for example, all right, we're going to start off with some amino acids. Well, what do amino acids make? So if we start to string enough amino acids together, we can build a protein, all right? And then our proteins can build larger structures. So folks that are into the weightlifting, all right, <laughs> And this just made me think about last semester, and it goes back to me and the weightlifting stuff. I know that some of my sections tease me about that, but that's all right, all right? But when we are going to increase muscle mass, we need to increase our proteins so we can help to increase the contractile proteins, all right, which are going to be, all right, actin and myosin, okay? When we increase the number of the actin and myosin contractile filaments, our muscles will get larger. All right, they will hypertrophy, okay? And in some cases, we'll get some hyperplasia. All right, another function of the endocrine system is going to be obviously one of the most important uh, components is going to be maintaining homeostasis, but maintaining homeostasis of our blood composition. What does that mean? What's in our blood? All right, the solutes, glucose, ions, sodium, potassium, calcium, all that stuff, all right? All the different types of, of, of um, components that are going to be necessary for maintaining our homeostatic environment, okay? And not only that, all right, not just the composi comp composition, we need to maintain blood volume, okay? Because if you start to lose blood volume, that's a problem, okay? That is hypotension. All right, your blood volume decreases. That means your blood pressure is going to decrease alongside of it. That's bad because your brain doesn't like that. And guess what? A lot of other tissues don't like it either, okay? So these hormones are gonna help to regulate that blood volume, all right? And also the components of what's in the blood, for example, your red blood cells, your white blood cells, and platelets, let's not forget them, okay? So we're gonna talk about that throughout the semester too, okay? 
big time role in digestion. Okay, it's really, really cool how the hormones play a role in the secretion of digested enzymes and how it also is going to play a role in the movement, all right, of that food product that you put into your mouth and that you've swallowed and it's gone into your stomach and is now starting to move through your small and large intestines, all right, we're going to see how some of the hormones are going to play a role in that, all right. And then we'll also see how it plays a role in reproductive activities. Well, obviously, as you know, which is important, all right, for any organism, all right, is to reproduce. So we'll talk about how uh, development occurs, all right, and some of the functions of the reproductive systems. And we'll talk about that in other chapters too, okay? All right, it's not all just in this chapter, okay? All right. So let's talk about some of the endocrine glands. And we're gonna review some of this, all right, when we get into uh, lab also. Okay, so some of these slides do repeat, but that's okay, because if you're learning here and you're learning in lab, you're getting a twofer, all right, for the price of one, and it'll make it a lot easier for you to study, okay? So first and foremost, there are four types of tissue in the body. Ah, you thought you didn't have to know that stuff anymore, okay? One type of tissue is, well, actually, I take that back. Two types of tissue are listed on this slide, okay? Can anyone tell me, you can type it into the chat box, all right, the four tissue types, all right? You got it, nervous, that's one of them. <clears throat> Anyone else want to chime in? Connective, that's right, CT, muscle, three out of four. Yep, yeah, and epithelial, good job, good job, good job, good job. Yes, that is right, all right? Epithelial tissue, connective tissue, muscle tissue, and nervous tissue. We're gonna be revisiting, all right, these tissues, and if you have a pretty good foundation and understanding of those tissues, then this semester will be a bit easier for you, okay? So when we're talking about endocrine glands, this comes out of chapter five when we were talking about tissues, all right? Endocrine glands contain epithelial tissue, all right? But also surrounding that epithelial tissue, we'll find connective tissue. Remember, connective tissue is the most, uh, uh, um, what's the word I want to use? Um, I don't want to say dominant. Um, oh my gosh, my brain's not working. It's only Monday and it's the first day of class. Uh, connective tissue is the most diverse, thank you, abundant, thank you very much. Abundant and diverse type of tissue in your body, okay? So it only makes sense that we're gonna see it here in our endocrine glands and it helps to provide the framework, all right, for these glands, okay? So some of these glands are actually considered organs, and their job is to just produce hormones, okay? So we're going to talk about these glands. The pituitary, we briefly talked about last semester. Pineal, what does the pineal gland produce? Anyone recall? Pineal gland. Melatonin, booyah! Nice, yes. The pineal gland produces melatonin, okay, which is going to help with your circadian rhythms, your sleep-wake cycle. Okay, well, and we're going to get, in, we're going to talk about all these glands individually. All right, parathyroid, remember that one? That was chapter seven, talking about bone mass and density and whatnot when we're dealing with calcium blood levels. All right, parathyroid is largely important when your blood calcium levels drop. This guy gets active. All right, and then adrenal glands, we're going to blow your mind with the adrenal glands with all the stuff that they do, okay? So some of these glands are going to be solely endocrine organs. Now, some, all right, some of the endocrine cells are going to be found in other organs, all right? They'll be in a clustered uh, uh, configuration, okay? All right, but these other organs have other functions, okay? So the king of these is the hypothalamus. Remember in 210, and I know I keep referring to that, and I'm going to keep doing it all semester long, but the hypothalamus, all right, does many things, all right? We're going to focus on its endocrine function. You'll find out quite a bit, all right? Skin, thymus, we'll go through this. I'm not going to read all these out, 
all right? But you're gonna see, all right, that you'll have endocrine cells that are going to be found in organs, all right? And these organs have other functions that, other than endocrine functions, okay? All right, so this is just kind of giving you a picture, all right, and showing you, all right, all these different glands and tissues, all right, that have epithelial tissue that has an endocrine function, okay? Pancreas, adipose connective tissue, I mean, all this stuff, and we'll go through that. <clears throat> all right, so let's talk about how we make hormones and how we release hormones, okay? So this first sentence on this slide basically sums up that reflex arc, okay, that we learned about in chapter 13 or 14. I think it's chapter 13. No, it's chapter 14. <laughs> chapter 13 is the brain. All right. So remember, there's five components to the reflex arc. And I'm going to tell you this right now, okay? I'm going to try to write them out. Um, give me one second. Go here. All right. So the five components All right, are uh, number one, stimulus. Okay, you have to have a stimulus. Okay, number two, you have to have a receptor. <laughs> You have to have a receptor that is going to pick up that stimulus, okay? Now, that receptor has to be able to, uh, it's the, it needs to be specific to that stimulus, much like we said, all right? Photoreceptors can't pick up auditory sound, okay, and vice versa, all right? So you're not going to be able to see things with your, your auditory receptors, okay? All right, so then, all right, that receptor is going to transmit, all right, that sensory info to the control center. Well, you can tell a bad typer, all right, to the control center, where that control center is now going to process, interpret, and then it's going to decide on how it's going to respond, okay? And then when it figures out what kind of response, it's going to transmit to the periphery, okay? Meaning it's gonna transmit that all right, response to an effector, oops, organ. Did I spell that wrong? Yep. To an effector organ, okay? What's an effector organ? There's two, okay? First one is muscle. And then the second one is going to be what we're going to talk about, a gland, okay? So we're going to go through all of these different components for the rest of this, um, well, not for the rest of this uh, chapter, but you're going to follow this pattern. Some sort of stimulus is going to occur. A receptor is going to pick up that stimulus, and it's going to send that information to the control center, all right? And then that control center is going to process that information and decide how it's going to respond. Then it's going to transmit its response to the periphery, to an effector organ, which can be a muscle or a gland. Okay? All right. 
questions about any of that so far? Do some of this kind of um, does some of this kind of come back to does it make sense? You remember some of this? I hope. I pray. All right, that's cool. If it doesn't, some of it will come back. All right. So that's what we're talking about here, all right? That hormone release is going to be, oh yeah, it's like the Kool-Aid man, oh yeah, all right? The hormone release is going to be all right, regulated by the reflex arc. And in order for us to have a reflex, we have to have a stimuli. If you don't have a stimuli, you got nothing. This won't, none of this is gonna happen, okay? All right, so there's three ways all right, that we are going to stimulate our endocrine release, okay? The first one is what we call hormonal stimulation, okay? So we're going to have our gland, all right, our effector is gonna release its hormone, all right, when another hormone binds to it, okay? So we go through those five steps, okay? And then a hormone gets released, all right, from one gland, it circulates and it finds another gland and it stimulates that gland, okay? That's like the pituitary gland stimulating the thyroid gland to release thyroxin, okay? The second type is gonna be humoral stimulation. Humoral is an old term in reference, all right, to our blood, okay? So now, again, another gland, all right, is going to release its hormone, right? And its hormone is going to affect the levels of nutrients or ions in our blood, all right? And I'll show you examples of these on the next page, okay? And then finally, nervous stimulation, which you're already familiar with the nervous stimulation because we talked about that in chapter 15 in 210. All right, when we were talking about the prevertebral ganglia, I know this is like, well, I don't remember any of this. All right, but basically when you release norepinephrine and epinephrine, okay? So basically a gland cell will release its hormone when a neuron stimulates it, okay? All right, so those are the three ways to do it. So you know me, for those of you that don't, you're about to find out. Okay, um, whoops. All right, pictures, I love pictures, okay? So some of the types of our endocrine stimulation, you zoom in a little bit, it's tough to read, I'm old. All right, we'll start with hormonal. All right, we're, we're gonna be talking about this one probably the most in this chapter, okay? Hormonal stimulation, okay? This is like what I was saying. Okay, the pituitary gland here, okay, is going to release, all right, what's called TSH, which is thyroid stimulated hormone into the blood. It's going to circulate around and then it's going to travel to the thyroid gland and it's going to stimulate the thyroid gland to release thyroxin or thyroid hormone. Okay, so that is hormonal stimulation. The release of one hormone triggers the release of another hormone. Okay, the next one is humoral stimulation. Okay, you've kind of seen this indirectly when we talked about insulin briefly, okay? So changes in the uh, nutrient or ion level in the blood, okay, are going to stimulate the release of a specific hormone. Perfect example, high blood sugar levels, all right, is going to stimulate, all right, the release of insulin, all right? Low blood levels will, re, will stimulate the release of glucagon, okay? If, and you heard me mention this earlier. Low blood calcium levels are going to stimulate the release of, wait for it, PTH, okay? And PTH gets to work with vitamin D, which helps to increase your blood calcium levels. And then if your blood calcium levels get too high, well, don't worry, we got a hormone for that. That's called calcitonin. We'll talk about that soon, all right? And then finally, we've got our nervous system stimulation, 
okay? This is part of the fight or flight, all right? Not solely, but part of it, all right? So the nervous system, not to be left out, is gonna trigger the release of a hormone. And we saw this, all right, when our sympathetic nervous system triggers the release of our norepinephrine and epinephrine, all right, from the adrenal medulla, okay? And we saw how we had our preganglionic axon. Remember, we learned about all the different um, chains. You know, there's two or three neurons in a, in a chain. Well, this one only has one. It goes directly from the spinal cord, goes into the sympathetic uh, chain, doesn't synapse, enters, goes right through the prevertebral ganglia, doesn't synapse, goes directly to um, the adrenal gland, to the medulla, and releases norepinephrine and epinephrine. Okay? So those are the three ways that we are going to stimulate, all right, our endocrine system, okay? Know those. Those are on plenty of tests, okay? Almost done. Uh, there we go. All right, circulating hormones, okay? Circulating hormones, all right, um, when we talk about the circulating hormones, that's going to be a lot of the stuff that we're going to be talking about, like growth hormone, you know, insulin, all that stuff, all right? You've got circulating hormones, and then you also have local hormones, and we'll talk about those. Those are the, uh, one of the classifications is the acosinoids, all right? So one type of circulating hormone is going to be our steroids, okay? We talked about this in Chapter 2, okay, when we were learning about lipids, all right? A lipid is a fat, Okay, and if it's fat soluble, that means, all right, it can dissolve into fat. So lipid soluble molecules are wonderful because they can move across the plasma membrane. Because remember, our plasma membrane is going to, it is, a, is, is a phospholipid bilayer. So lipid soluble anything can, can, can move across the plasma membrane nicely. So steroids all right, come from cholesterol. That is why, all right, it is important that you have, all right, cholesterol in your diet, believe it or not. Now, I'm not giving you free reign to go ahead and eat potato chips, all right, and, and, and shove in a lot of animal fats into your face, all right, but you need cholesterol. Cholesterol is good, all right, but just like anything, it needs to be in moderation, okay, because, that cholesterol is going to be a precursor to make our steroids, all right? And steroids, all right, are going to be our sex hormones, estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, all right? A lot of that is going to come. You can see down here on our list here, cortisol, that's the stress hormone, and then aldosterone, that's going to be an important hormone that we need to regulate blood composition, okay? All right, so... Our steroids are going to be made, and you want to know this, in the adrenal cortex. We'll get into that, all right? The adrenal cortex is the outer candy shell of the adrenal gland. Here's a picture of the adrenal gland right here. That's not a picture of it. That's a picture. Here's the adrenal gland. This purplish, bluish area here, that's the adrenal medulla. That's the inside. And then the outside here, that's the cortex. That's where we get a lot of our steroid hormones from. Not solely, but a lot, okay? All right, and then calcitriol. Well, what's calcitriol? Does anyone know what calcitriol is? Does it come to mind? Anybody? This is us wiping away a lot of our, that's right, that's right, girl, vitamin D, the active form of vitamin D. And does anybody know what organ activates vitamin D? What organ converts calcidiol into calcitriol? Close. Yes, it's the kidney. The kidney. All right. Cholecalciferol, which is the inactive form, all right, your skin synthesizes that shoots that into the bloodstream, it travels throughout the body, goes to the liver, then the liver converts that into, all right, calcidiol, still inactive, then it circulates throughout the body, and then calcidiol goes to the kidneys and is converted into calcitriol, and it's made into 
vitamin, the active form of vitamin D. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Um, let me do one more slide here on circulating hormones. Actually, there's two. Quickly, quickly through this. All right. Another type of circulating hormone are the biogenic amines, the monoamines. You may remember this. These are also going to be neurotransmitters. Okay. The monoamines are. Okay. So basically, what are they? They're modified amino acids. Okay. So that's going to make up our catecholamines. We'll get into that. Catecholamines are going to be what we find in our um, the hormones norepinephrine and epinephrine. All right, thyroid and melatonin. Hey, melatonin, there it is again. All right, so these are water-soluble except for thyroid hormone. And if you're water-soluble, you're going to have a hard time getting across the plasma membrane. Okay, makes it tough. Okay, um, what is easy? What can cross across the plasma membrane relatively easily? Two things. You have to have two characteristics that allow things to diffuse or move across the plasma membrane. Do you all remember? Two characteristics. One is you got to be really small, really, really small. And the other one is nonpolar. So you need to be nonpolar and small, correct, not large or charged. I like that. Not large, tell them large marge sent you. Large or charged. Yes, correct. So you want to be small and nonpolar. You can move across the plasma membrane. Okay. Um, so that's what we're going to see here with our biogenic means. Like I said, they're water-soluble except for the thyroid hormone, okay? And then finally, the last one here, all right, for the circulating hormones, then we'll take a quick break, all right, are going to be the proteins, okay? So most of our hormones fall into this category here. Again, proteins, they're water-soluble. How many amino acids do you need to be considered a protein? Anything larger than, there's a certain number I'm thinking, larger than what? Does anyone have an idea? This is coming back from chapter two. That's right. That is right. Two hundred. Okay. So if you're two hundred or more, you're considered a protein. Okay. If you are less than two hundred, you are an illegal peptide, polypeptide. Okay. All right, um, I would love to talk more, but I am going to take a break so I can have my salad. All right, let's take about a 10, uh, let's take a 15 minute break. All right, and hold on one second.